Okay, so <clears throat> today we have the uh, last introduction lecture of this week. Um, after having a um, short topic around uh, developing the Fab Academy documentation website every day. And um, I hope that all of you did uh, not have any problems uh, looking up the videos uh, and the topics that we discussed in the previous days. And um, for the following weeks, the structure is going to be a bit um, easier to understand, to follow uh, in terms of lectures. We are going to have the global lecture on Wednesdays and the local lecture on Thursdays. And the rest of the time, uh, I would suggest to use to complete the assignments. Um, a note on the global lecture on Wednesdays is that uh, it is in, in the official course schedule, it is scheduled to be at three o'clock. And as you see that the lectures actually start at four o'clock, the global ones. And usually before, before the global lectures, we have a 30 minutes of uh, prep uh, where I have to join as an instructor. And um, I'm just thinking that we could start with a brief uh, with a brief discussion at three o'clock, like really short one uh, that would last, uh, let's say 25 to, to 30 minutes every Wednesday. And then I would have 30 minutes of time to join the uh, global instructor preparation. And then starting from four o'clock, uh, we would uh, all join the global uh, lecture. <clears throat> and then on, um, on Thursdays, at the, starting from three o'clock, uh, we would have one hour, maybe sometimes two hours to go over the practicalities. And I would, um, uh, I would give you a lecture about the practicalities of uh, the assignment itself. So in the, in the context of the, the week after the next one, it's going to be about digital, uh, about computer aided design. So that means that I would introduce you a bit more um, to the options that you could use for, um, for choosing the right computer aided design software for your project. And then um, well, if it's about 3D printing, then I would go over practical things regarding that and the other topics in the same manner. Um, but today, ah, yeah, well, just before I begin, um, I'm also going to set up the um, calendar invitations and all the descriptions. Uh, so I'm going to make sure that the schedule is available from uh, multi multiple resources so that you uh, do not miss the thing. So because I think it's sometimes it might be confusing. So this course is not the easiest in terms of scheduling and um, changes can happen in the last minute also because of pandemic. Uh, and one challenge that we're going to have is the booking of the space so that we do, do not end up too many people in the same room at the same time. Mm, so I'm going to make sure that you have the information available from multiple sources. Uh, I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to make a calendar invitation. I'm going to update the My Courses page. And of course, for the uh, official Fab Academy students, um, yeah, there's going to be a schedule on the official website. And uh, if, if you have questions, then uh, just feel free to ask. All right. Uh, but image and video optimization, uh, that's today's topic. And um, I think it's an important one because um, we want to, we want our websites to load fast. And uh, when we are opening a computer program on your, on our computers, we want it to load fast. And uh, in the context of web design, it is important that you optimize your images and videos so that uh, everybody can actually access your content. And I'm going to talk about background, about image types, uh, some simple ones, not all of them, uh, then some basic term and terminology and uh, why to optimize. Uh, so I told um, 
a little bit about that already. And then I'm going to um, go over uh, some tools uh, that are related to creation of images and videos and also compression, mostly compression, <clears throat> most importantly compression. And then I'm going to, uh, as usual, I'm going to show a demonstration of how to use these tools. So basically, uh, if you're talking about web design, there are two types of images. Uh, one is vector images, uh, where which is very good if you need um, to show some really clear high resolution shapes uh, and geometric elements. And then there are raster images, uh, which consist of pixels. Uh, so vector images just really have a SVG extension. So this is uh, um, sort of a universal uh, container for vector images. Uh, I know that Adobe Illustrator has their own proprietary AI format, but even they implemented uh, SVG. And for example, if you use uh, software like Inkscape, which is an open source alternative to uh, Illustrator, then you will notice that they, they are just using one main file format, which, which is SVG. Uh, SVG translates to scalable vector graphics. Um, and it's, uh, if you open a SVG file, if it's not compressed, then uh, you will see that its structure is very similar to the HTML structure. And uh, what is good about vector images is that it remains um, crisp when you zoom in it. So for example, if you have, so this is a, the way also how fonts on computers are designed. So these are, um, fonts are usually saved uh, in a vector format. So the shapes are, consist of points, lines, and Bezier curves. Uh, and when you zo zoom in, to them, then they are always uh, re-rendered at any, at every level. And uh, no matter how much you zoom in, you, you always have clear lines. And then raster images usually have a limited amount of pixels in them. Um, then these pixels are arranged on screen depending on what is the width and height value of the image. So, yeah, if it's a full HD picture, then it's usually 1920 by 1080 pixels. And basically the amount of pixels you can calculate by multiplying the width value with the height value. And when you zoom in, then you will notice that uh, these little square, squares uh, appear because the, the amount of pixels in this file is limited and it is not scaling uh, as well as, as the vector image. But uh, both of them are important because both of them, uh, each of them lets you represent a certain kind of image um, better in certain contexts. And for raster images, we use PNG or Portable Network, Network Graphics or JPEG images. Uh, I think JPEG stands for Joint Photography Group. Um, and uh, PNG is, uh, is a sort of... Uh, more flexible format for graphics that are not so large. It's uh, it's also compressed format, but uh, like the the benefits of PNG are, for example, that you can have a transparent background with your image, uh, so you can you can have um, additional value for each pixel that defines its transparency. Um, on the other hand, JPEG, it doesn't have that. Uh, so it usually is plain RGB, so red, green, and blue values. But it is really good uh, if you want to compress your image. And it's also well, so both of these formats are well supported by all the browsers and image viewers um, on, on all systems. So about videos, uh, so videos are basically sequences of uh, raster images, and uh, then you arrange them according to the frame rate um, and the timing settings uh, of, the, of the file, and you apply a compression um, <clears throat> algorithm to them. And compression these days is important. Uh, so basically YouTube wouldn't happen if there wouldn't be any uh, successful compression algorithms. And since uh, initially the, the uh, internet bandwidth and also the processing power of computers was uh, relatively low, 
So you would need to compress the uh, videos, first of all, to be able to transfer them to a server and then from a server distribute to all the clients. And then you would need uh, also optimize them in a way that they are not over compressed so that the actual computers of ours can decode them frame by frame and play back smoothly. And nowadays the most popular on the internet is H264 uh, compression algorithm. Um, the, there is a slight transition to, uh, to H265, which supports 4K videos, for example. I've tried that uh, with the Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, it works. Uh, but I think it's going to be still like five years when, uh, where, where the H264 uh, compression is going to be the most popular. Um, because I don't think that the, all the monitors and are going to be replaced with 4K monitors uh, anytime too soon. And then usually this compressed uh, video and also audio stream for audio MP3 and ACC um, AAC uh, format is the most popular. I'm not going to talk about that here. So that those two are combined and put into a, contain, a container uh, or basically a file with a certain extension. And this extension basically defines what kind of a container it is. Uh, on web, uh, I suggest you to stick to MP3 or WebM. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to practically experience that a little bit later. Uh, so here, yeah, so all the videos and uh, also the raster images, they consist of pixels. Uh, so one pixel, you can show it like this. So this is like an image that just shows something very nice and beautiful from the nature, like a photograph. Uh, and uh, it consists of squares of these square elements. Each of these uh, has a color. And then if we look at uh, many of these uh, scaled down and placed next to, next to each other, then we get an optical illusion and uh, our brain is basically making an image. Then, um, then we somehow recognize that there are different elements and uh, then we apply some meaning to those. Um, but that's a different story. Uh, so in one pixel is basically represented by three values usually. So red, green, and blue. Um, on a computer monitor. Each pixel on the computer monitor has usually has these three elements. In the old CRT monitors, these would be basically three LEDs for each of the pixel. And then, um, so in this case, this uh, color, this lax or salmon color, uh, these are actual values that I took from, from this square. Um, so there is a red value, which is full, which is 255. So in order to understand why it is 255 and why it's the maximum, you will have to dig a little bit deeper into how binary code works. Uh, so basically, if you take eight bits, um, or let's say uh, eight uh, positions, which can be only ones or zeros, and uh, you kind of calculate how many combinations you can have, then you will arrive uh, to a result of 256. Um, but why, you might ask, why the maximum value then is 255? This is because in computing, the minimum value usually is zero and it's counted as a value. So you get 256 values uh, um, if you start counting uh, from zero to 255. So in each of these, uh, each of these uh, LEDs or colors, <coughs> can um, you can scale them from zero to 255. In the case of um, so, if you are if you if the file format uh, is defined as eight bits per channel file format, it exists. You can save also your file, and you can also work with images um, where a pixel is defined as 16 bits, and there you have much more. Um, you can, you, you can, I mean, it's, it allows you to create more colors than you can actually recognize as being a, as a human. Um, so yeah, uh, and um, so this is 255, then the green is 123. So I mean, if, if a pixel, uh, so if one of these channels is zero, that means that it's black. If it's 255, it's uh, full, uh, it's fully saturated. 
So it's the brightest possible uh, representation of the color. And then if all of these three are maximum values, uh, like 255, then when you mix them together, then you get white. If all of them are zero, then you get black. And it is important to optimize your images because uh, you know if people do are not able to load your website or use your software nicely, uh, then you know people can arrive to situations like these, and it's not really nice that you force them into this situation. So this is why I would like to introduce you to some uh, image production and editing. Um, tools first. So you should explore, you should try to explore these during the during the following week and get comfortable with them. Uh, so you should learn to take screenshots on your systems. Uh, so in different systems, there are different ways how to do that. Um, I briefly talk about, I talked about that yesterday in the global session, uh, how to do it on, uh, on Linux system. Um, but yeah, on each of the operating systems, the ways are a little bit different, but uh, I, will, I will leave it up to you to, to explore um, how to do it on each of your systems. Then I highly recommend that you synchronize your devices uh, because during the course, you will take pictures and videos uh, for documentation. So let's say you will document multiple phases of your uh, circuit board production you will take screenshots from the design software and then you will take pictures of the boards that you are going to mill and you will take a video of uh, how you solder the components on them and if you have uh, some sort of uh, file sharing uh, service running on your uh, on your systems uh, that allow you to easily transfer files from your phone or camera to your computer where you usually do your work uh, it's going to make your life much, much easier. Dropbox is not the only option. So this is, uh, you can use Nextcloud, uh, or if you are into setting up mm, your own file sharing systems, uh, you can you can do that. Uh, there's own cloud also. Uh, I, I don't know, I wouldn't recommend uh, Microsoft OneDrive. Uh, it's really bad. It doesn't run also on Linux systems nicely. But for uh, image editing, um, if you do not use or are not fond of uh, the Adobe package and Photoshop, then yeah, you can use these two. So GIMP or Krita. So these are nice for creating images, uh, raster images from, from scratch. So you can draw geometry, you can uh, draw text, you can edit uh, existing photographs, you can scale them down. But if you just need to scale uh, scale them down and up and uh, crop, then maybe these are uh, an overkill because it's, uh, usually you need to start them. And the interface is quite filled with uh, with all kinds of features that you do not necessarily need and so on. But this is good software for creating and editing complex images. Then Inkscape is a good uh, vector editor, uh, which is open source. And Scribus is a nice layout editor. Uh, so if you are um, you have used InDesign, then Scribus is basically InDesign for Linux. Uh, of course, you know, the interface is not as user friendly as uh, Adobe, uh, Adobe's one, but uh, I've been trying it out and it also has a lot of nice uh, automation features. For layouting, um, yeah, for example, if you're thinking about layouting your master's thesis or doctoral dissertation, then probably you will go for something like LaTeX, uh, which is a really old layouting software, but it is also very rich in terms of tools around it. And uh, it's basically sort of markdown, but more powerful. Um, <clears throat> and you can generate academically academic layouts very, uh, very easily with that. Uh, so this is a screenshot from uh, Krita. So it's, yeah, when you when you launch it, so they managed to build the user interface and uh, all the graphics around it uh, very nicely. And it has a certain vibe to it. So basically Krita, you can use it for image editing, uh, but uh, the, I think the, the purpose 
that they advertise Krita with uh, is, is digital painting, basically. So for video, so we need sometimes to produce videos and edit them. Uh, so in order to do live streams um, and to capture your screen and then publish your opinion on YouTube, stream on YouTube, um, well, yeah, yeah, basically like capture your screen. So let's say you want to record a short video about uh, to kind of show what you, what kind of methods, so to kind of prove that you were actually working with a certain kind of uh, software or you discovered some interesting trick or you run into a problem and you want to make a video out of it, uh, I would suggest to use OBS Studio. Um, you will need to spend like an hour to get into it and to understand all the uh specials uh, special features of it but it's very stable and uh, and it's open source yes it's free and open source and it's basically the best uh, uh open uh broadcasting studio software that, that you can get on the internet Re replaces all kinds of uh, expensive proprietary frameworks uh, that tell so basically, you, you get a television a channel on, on your on your computer for free. Uh, and then you can add multiple cameras, you can add multiple microphones, uh, you can use slides and you can um, put them over your own image, uh, camera image or, or screen share. And then for video editing, uh, you will need that. You sometimes need to chop a video in pieces and you need to make some parts of it faster or slow slow them down, or you need to fix uh, some some text or some images in, in the video. So you can use K K KDN Live. Uh, like it's sort of Adobe Premiere or uh, what was this other one? A Final Cut Studio uh, for Mac computers, for Mac OS, uh, but, it, but it's open source and free. Um, and you can also use Zoom and uh, all this, these conferencing software, uh, softwares, programs that, that are available in order to record your lectures and conversations. And then for image optimization, uh, so there, is, there are a lot of tools with a graphical user interface. So you have Preview on Mac, which is pre-installed by default. Uh, when I was a Windows user, I really loved the uh, Irfan view, um, not just because it has a cat in its logotype, but also because uh, it's very powerful. And on Linux, uh, I recently just discovered this G -thumb, G -thumb, uh, which is, I think it's available if your operating system makes use of the GNOME um, uh, window uh, or desktop environment. Uh, and, and then on the command line, uh, Image Magic is a really powerful set of tools that you can use to automate um, your image processing uh, process. So, for example, if you're, uh, it's not, it's not just fast uh, and efficient, um, and uh, you know, it doesn't just make you feel like the main character of a hacker movie when you're using it, but it's also very useful when you. When you are building a web automated web application, for example, and let's say you have a user interface where people are uploading images, and then let's say you want to create a, a GIF out of these images, so you can write a script on the back end by using plain um, Bash command line scripting uh, language, in you know, where where basically it. Uh, let's say copies the uploaded files to one directory, renames them, orders them in a certain sequence, and then runs um, a set of these image magic uh, command line tools in order to resize them and uh, squish them together into one GIF file. And then further, you could publish it and uh, whatnot. Yeah, so th this is very powerful, but it takes some time and effort to get into it. Uh, then for video compression, so you can use uh, Handbrake, uh, which is an uh, open uh, open tool, a uh, free tool um, with a graphical user interface. This is really nice. It has many presets. Um, and if you need to uh, downscale um, a video from 4K to full HD or for full HD to just HD or even smaller, uh, you need to reduce frame rate of the video to make the file size smaller, then you can use uh, this so it's all, all visible 
So for people who are used to graphical user interfaces, this is the way to go. But I would suggest you to explore. Um, oh, so there's command lines. This is not GTHUMB. This is actually uh, FFmpeg. So it's the FFmpeg logo also. Um, so, and this has the same positive properties uh, as as image magic. So if you want to automate something, uh, let's say you're building an interactive installation and uh, you build a web interface where people can upload their selfies uh, or I don't know, you have, a, you have access to a Twitter feed with images um, uh, and videos. So you can use uh, FFmpeg in, to automatically them, bash process them, publish them, uh, scale them, cut them, convert into GIFs, uh, into images, into image sequences and whatnot. And now, what was it that I wanted to show for demonstration? Here. Um, do you have any questions so far, by the way? All right, if not, um, so here I have uh, two videos um, and two images. So, This is from a project that we did um, last year at the Fab Lab, <laughs> like the last project. So some testing action going on here. And there is uh, a video about how not to use a trimming tool. <laughs> Make sure that you flip this over. So this is a really useful tool. So for example, when you are uh, doing CNC milling and he, I will explain you a bit more about tabs. So we'll need to remove these tabs and uh, this trimming tool uh, helps you to achieve a smooth finish on the edge uh, very easily. Um, so what to do with these? Uh, so these are raw images uh, that I took from my camera. And uh, what do we wanna do? We wanna find out what is going on with their size. What kind of images are they? Um, Yeah, I'm gonna just, just jump right into the command line tools uh, first. So here we have the command line view of the same directory. And uh, so you see the video files are, have extension mob and, and the image files, they have the extension JPEG. Uh, but there's like really no indication about their size. I think on some systems you, you have a sidebar where you can see what is the size and pixels and what is the resolution about them. But um, sometimes you don't have that option. And for images, uh, you could you could use an image magic tool that's called identify. And in order to identify an image, you just have to copy and paste the, the name of it in here. Or instead of copying and pasting, you can just start typing and then let it autocomplete. And this is going to show us a bit more data about the image. And as you see, it's a JPEG. Uh, so this is the size in pixels. Uh, each pixel is eight bits. Uh, it's 
HSRGB color, color profile and some other parameters that I'm not really sure what they are. But essentially, I wanted to know how big, uh, in terms of pixels, this uh, this image is. So this is quite large for uh, for uh, for an image. Uh, if you want to if you want to put it on the on your website, we have similar tool uh, in order to similar way uh, how to tell a bit more about the video file. You can use FFmpeg and you can copy the name of one of the files or let's just start typing it. Yeah. And this is going to give us more information. So since video is a bit more complicated topic, also the information that you can get out of this is a bit more complicated. So uh, but what you can decipher is uh, where you should start looking at it is uh, the metadata. So you can see that the, the brand, uh, some other information about the creation of the file. And you can see the duration of it. Uh, what is the bitrate? What is the video codec? Ah, yeah, so here you start, uh, so these video files, usually they consist of streams. In each of these streams, they have information about the, the, the codec, compression codec, also the size, frame rate. Um, and then here stream 01, so that's the audio stream. Uh, and you can see that it's compressed using AC, compression codec. It's 44,100 hertz. So that's the sampling rate uh, when it's created and so on. And uh, in terms of this video file, it's also a bit big to publish on your website. Uh, maybe not in terms of length, but in terms of um, the size, and maybe the bit rate. So how to deal with that? Um, so for image magic, um, you can use a convert tool in order to scale the image down. And in order to scale it down, you can use the resize flag. And then you need to decide what is going to be the final size of the image. So I'm going to go with 1280 times 720. You can also define percentage. Uh, but in our case, I think it's nice to know. So for, for web uh, use, this is a nice scale. So it's going to look nice on, uh, on smaller screens and it's going to be enough pixels for bigger screens as well. And uh, I'm going to go with this JPEG file over here. So I could actually just click on rename and copy this and uh, Paste it in here. Uh, I'm using quotes here because uh, uh, it has a space in between. And if you are passing in a file uh, as an argument uh, in command line, it's nice to. It's gonna it's gonna think that this space is uh, like a separator in between arguments, and it's gonna basically take these as two separate arguments. So in order to avoid that, you need to uh, put. Uh, quotes around around the file name. And yeah, so the first parameter is the input file. And um, and then the output file. And you see it resized it. And what is interesting for us is to see what is the difference in the in terms of how much it occupies space on the computer. Maybe here we can also view it in a different way. Yeah, so you see that the original file uh, was 1.9 megabytes, and then the one that we resized is. 212 kilobytes, which is basically almost 10 times less than the original image. And if we open it up, 
it's not bad so it's you can still tell what's in it and how do we do this with um, videos but before uh, I showed that I could add one more thing so usually uh, for JPEG images you can specify the compression um, Compression quality. Mm. And uh, so in terminal, you'll also notice that whenever you press the up button, you can access the previous commands. So I'm just gonna press the up arrow and uh, to access the previous command, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add a flag, which is called quality. And I'm gonna set it to 65 and uh, I'm going to change the also like in order to navigate these long lines you're not going to be able to use your mouse cursor so you'll need to navigate it using the arrow keys and a nice uh trick uh, for you to remember uh, for you to practice and try to remember is that if you want to go to the beginning of the line you can press Control a and if you want to go to the end of the line you can press Control e in this case, it's nice to just jump to the end of the line because I wanted to add 65 here. And you see with an image quality, compression quality of 65, I went down to even 75.1 kilobytes. And this is, a, this is an image that we can use on the website. So this is not bad. It's gonna load really fast. Okay, so how can we do it um, with the with the videos? Um, in order to just uh, convert a video to a web format, so MOV is certainly not a format that you can put on your website. We are going to use this video file as an input. And uh, so the way how you use FFmpeg is uh, similar in the ways that you, you need to add arguments, uh, command line arguments to, to the line, but the different ones. And uh, dash VF means video filter. And following that, we need to add what kind of filter we want to use. It's going to be the scale filter, and each of the filters that obviously has different syntax. And we want to scale it down to HD resolution, which is going to be so 1280 that times 720, so it's 16 by 9. And then we can uh, specify output. video resized mp4 hit enter <laughs> and as you can see it tells you at which position of video it is while compressing so yeah, here, the first zeros is hours, then these are minutes and these are seconds. And we managed to compress the original file from 28.9 megabytes to 4.4 megabytes. You can open up in VLC. Still looks good. And uh, to even more scale it down, so sometimes we do not need the full length of the video. So this was uh, 
almost 15 seconds. So we can actually cut it. So let's take this as an input. This is the starting point. And before, uh, so this dash I actually means input. So the input file that we are going to use. And before that, we can specify where should we start <coughs> compressing the file. So we are taking that input. Um, and then we are skipping to, I think that instead of doing this, we can just also put it after. So we're taking that input and then with the SS flag, we decide where we start, where we want to start cutting. Let's say that the second four is, is the, the time when we realize that we want to start cutting and we want to take five seconds from second four. And um, as simple as that, we need to define dash T to specify the number of seconds that we want to take from the file. And at the end, I'm going to add five seconds. Hit enter. Here we have it, and we have a video of uh, 1.4 megabytes. Uh, and you see, so we scaled it down from 28, uh, so 30 megabytes to 1.4, so it's almost 20 times compression and it still looks good. Um, you can, of course, do it with the uh, with a graphical user interface tools, uh, but that's that's something that shouldn't be too difficult uh, to figure out. So you now you have seen the slides and you know where to get them. And uh, for those, I think it's shouldn't be too complicated to figure out uh, how to deal with them yourselves. But now, so the next part is how do we put these images and videos into your into into your website. So the with the images I showed already, but with the videos I didn't. Uh, so how about we copy these two and we go to our Hugo repository and here in the static I wonder if the static directory would be the best directory for it. I think that content wise, you should put these into the content directory. And I'm gonna create a new directory here, which is gonna be called assets. I'm gonna put them here, or maybe instead of assets, I'm gonna call it media. And here, I'm going to open up Atom in this directory. And as for the content, in the final project page, I could reference the image. Yeah, this is what I didn't show yet. Um, how to how to add an image uh, via Markdown file. So let's take a look at the media. We need this image. We're gonna copy its name.
And uh, for an image, I think we need to use the exclamation mark. And then this within this within the square brackets, we define the alternative description. So in case we cannot find the image, the browser cannot find the image. And uh, the image is gonna be loaded. Um, so here in the content directory, you should uh, think of it as, um, so the structure is gonna be repeated. So basically the final project um, section is gonna see these two folders as being in the same, on the same level. Uh, so if I type media and I paste this in, it should be visible. So I'm gonna save this, go back to terminal, run the Hugo server and open this up in the browser. If I go to the final project page, Uh, I think there's something wrong in the layout. So if I go to layout and default and single, yeah, I don't have content. So here I need to put um, another template variable like this. and somehow it cannot access it because I think it is because um, this final project is perceived to, so what is being done, it's, it's, uh, it's Hugo is creating a directory and we actually have to look one level up from it. So let's add this double dot and forward slash for it to be able to do so. And yeah, and here it is. And for videos, uh, <clears throat> so there's no video tag in Markdown, so it, it gets a bit more complicated, but uh, I think I'm gonna change the, uh, gonna take the challenge to show you. Uh, so in the layouts, so if you're missing some certain HTML functionality or structure, uh, structural element or possibilities to start HTML, certain st HTML structure, then you have the opportunity to introduce the so-called short codes. And short codes are basically snippets, layout snippets that you can uh, use in Markdown. And usually you use them by using the template tags and an opening and closing tag. And let's say that this is gonna be our video. And Like so, and in between this, we can actually copy the file name. Oh, try to open it. It's not what I wanted. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just type it in. like so and what we see here in the so hugo is telling us that there's an error which is a normal uh, behavior so it tells us that it cannot find the video shortcode so let's go and create it so in the layouts directory we will create a new subfolder shortcodes and we're going to add a new file called video.html. And uh, I think that we can access the content in between the opening and closing tag 
by using this. All right, also stopped the server. It was such a heavy error. And now here, and we see that we can access the actual path of the video. So how do we build the HTML structure around it? So this is something that we can ask the Mozilla Developer Network documentation. And we can just copy and paste some code from here. In the short code file. So video, so we can add some attributes. Uh, so we can add controls. Uh, so if you look at the page, so it has some attributes. So here there's autoplay attribute. So we can drop in that. So it starts automatically playing. Then, yeah, controls, control list. Uh, it's sometimes nice to use the loop one. So since we have a five second video, then we would like it to loop uh, as a GIF. And here you can define multiple sources of the same video and the browser is gonna decide which is uh, better for it. In our case, we just have an MP3 and that's just enough for most of the browsers. Um, so we're just gonna cut and paste this into the source attribute here. And then if the browser cannot load the video or doesn't support the tag, then it's gonna display this message, but it's not going to happen in our case. I'm going to save this, go back to our website over here. Or maybe there's something that Ah, it adds extra quotes over here. That's, I think, the problem. So let's see. Yeah, there are spaces. That's why. <coughs> and here we go. But it's not automatically playing because I think we need to edit the short code so that these attributes have actual values. And we can loops. So, yeah, I think that's it. So thank you for today. And I think we are ready to switch uh, over to the global lecture now. So this was recorded and it's gonna be available on the YouTube channel under the Web Basics playlist.